You're listening to a 4x4, 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the Jeep Talk Show with Jeep Mama. Are you sure? Josh. Yeah, I don't think so. And Dewey. I think that's a huge deal. So sit back, strap in, and brace yourself. Oh, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you have a Jeep, want a Jeep, or never driven anything but Jeeps. This is the show for you. Josh, Tammy, and myself are here to inform and entertain you while we talk about... Jeeps. Now, see, she was ready this week. I like that. Jeeps. Hey, I'm Tony, and I'm announcing the end of the show. And my, tri- <gasps> and my trip around Africa. <laughs> uh, no. uh, hi, I'm Josh, and... Uh, a waiter? There's a fly in my studio. No, seriously, there is a like bumblebee-sized fly in my studio here somewhere, and he's already dive bombed me twice. Where so the hell's the cats? You, the cats need to so, be in here. Working the, you suddenly <laughs> hear me hit the floor and a shoulder roll, and the mic goes flying. Oh, that's Hi. what's going on. You're, you're slapping the fly. Hi, I'm Tammy, and I hope you take a moment this weekend to remember those who served and are no longer with us. Josh, what's coming up on this episode of the Jeep Talk Show? Well, Tammy, as always, I'm super glad you asked. We have the one and only Dan Greck. He's going to be joining us this week to talk about his overlanding trip around Africa in a Jeep. He's all done, and boy, did he need a shower. <laughs> now, this week in Jeep, we're going to hear about, <laughs> this week in Jeep, we're going to hear about a Go Topless Day event gone awry and the story of a Jeeper left for dead and how they were rescued. Wrangler Talk has some cleaning hacks for your Jeep, even though you might have a dirty mind. Nikki G calls us in to tell us how uncomfortable he is with rubbers. Uh, what's that? Oh, no, rubber tires. And a whole lot more coming up in the show, so stick around. Oh, man, I can just hear Tammy. You know, she needs to come out with a little recording uh, for cell phone ring or something where it says, This is Tammy, clean up your Jeep. Oh, hush. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important, Tony. And moving along. Local Jeep News, National Jeep News, and news from around the world. It's This Week in Jeep. And This Week in Jeep is brought to you by Amazon.com. If you didn't know, Amazon is a great source for Jeep parts. Sure, the parts store is quick and convenient, but why pay almost twice what you'd spend on Amazon? And now you can support the show and get the stuff you want most for your Jeep all in one click. Head over to our website, jeeptalkshow.com, and click the big Amazon logo there. That will take you right to Amazon.com, where anything you buy for your Jeep, or not for the Jeep, will give the Jeep Talk Show a little kickback. It's a great way to give back and show your support for the show. Remember, we never get to see who bought what, so have some fun with it, and happy shopping. That's jeeptalkshow.com, and click the big Amazon logo. Well, you never know just what you may find. A driver trapped in his Jeep as it dangled on a California cliffside thought he would die, and he very well might have, had it not been for skid marks and the woman who spotted them. Lori Bowers of Happy Camp, California, said she was driving to Oregon the morning of May 18th for lunch with her daughter when she noticed tracks leading off a rural road in the Siskiyou Mountains just before the road hit the state line. Bowers came upon some tracks going over the cliff there, and as she drove down the road a little ways past, she thought, might be a good idea to go back and just to see what's what. You know, that's kind of out of place. As she did, she looked over the edge and saw it. A red Jeep had gone down off the mountain road. The Jeep was lodged 50 feet down the side of an embankment, which had a steep slope of 40 degrees or more, according to an Illinois Fire District Facebook post. All that kept the Jeep from tumbling more than 1,000 feet further to the bottom of the ravine was a single tree, firefighters said. The first responders were dispatched to rescue the driver just after 10 a.m., but he had been trapped there since 2 a.m., according to the report. Rescuers secured the vehicle, and then paramedics began to care for the man, who was suffering from hypothermia, internal bleeding, and a quote-unquote badly fractured leg. This was a very difficult rescue due to the degree of slope and the location of the patient, authorities said. The Jeep owner's first words to the rescuers were, I thought I was going to die here. But the crew managed to lower equipment into the ravine, stabilize the driver, and then bring him back up. He was taken to Asante Rogue Regional Medical Center by helicopter and is said to be on his way to full recovery. Rescuers singled out Bowers for thanks, acknowledging that it was a good thing she was traveling by. If she had just continued driving to Oregon for lunch with her daughter that morning, authorities say the patient would have most likely died there in his Jeep. 
Bauer said she hopes others would do the same as she did. She asked people to, quote, just be more alert to what's going on when you are on these mountain roads, especially early in the morning. From all of us here at the Jeep Talk Show to Lori Bowers, thank you for being so observant and saving the life of a fellow Jeeper. Well, you know, just turning around uh, is the big thing. It's like, well, isn't that interesting? And, you know, it's, it's surely nobody slid off the off the road. That's probably just something that happened. I'm going to waste my time if I turn around and go back. I mean, all the things that go through our heads. Uh, sure. how, how many people would just go, no, I'm not going to find anything. That would be silly. Well, when you say tracks, was this like snow? No, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that um, there was somebody had maybe lost um, uh, – they were, weren't paying attention. Maybe they took their eyes off the road for a minute, lost control or something, and likely slammed on the brakes as they kind of went through a corner or something like that. I, I don't know the terrain. I don't know the road. I don't know the exact mm-hmm. location. I'm just, I mean, I'm kind of picturing the kinds of, uh, you know, backcountry roads, mountain roads that we have, you know, here in between Oregon and Washington and in and, and other parts of Oregon. And I'm kind of just sort of imagining what it would be like on those, this kind of scenario. Um, right. And, you know, it's very possible on those twisty mountain roads to, well, what's going on down here in the passenger seat and all crap, here's that corner that I thought I had a few hundred feet more to go and slam on the brakes and you've got, you know, you know, three or four car lengths of skid marks before the vehicle goes over off the, off the cliff. Now, the pictures that were online that I saw of this recovery, the Jeep was actually nose up, meaning wow. the back of the Jeep was facing down. So whether he had spun around during an impact um, or whether or not he, you know, jerked the wheel, tried to correct, slid and went ass over key tuttle, key, tea kettle over the side and basically went down the ravine, you know, butt first. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. There, there's so many details in this that really weren't shared during the report other than, I mean, good Lord, how this guy is extremely lucky that this woman drove by and had the wherewithal to notice something that was just, you know, kind of on the ground there. Most of us probably wouldn't even notice or wouldn't give it a second thought. But she actually did and turned right. around, and all because of that, this guy's life was saved. You know, if Josh. Saw- uh, you know, Josh. I like to think that uh, uh, just due to the injuries that he had, he couldn't. He got was able to do the three point turn, but just couldn't quite make it. To engage the lockers and crawl out of there. No, oh, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> but forty de- forty degree, uh, 40%, uh, forty percent, forty degree uh, incline there. I, with nothing but ferns and trees and, you know, dead leaves. Now, there's there's no Jeep that could have crawled up that. I mean, maybe with a winch line and stuff like that. Work but with me here. <laughs> it was pretty, the, the Jeep was in pretty bad shape. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'm glad and you made it. I also don't know which kind of Jeep it was. That's how bad this accident looked. I can wow. barely tell that, you know, what direction this vehicle was facing, let alone what kind of vehicle it was. I mean, wow. you can see the seven slot grill. You can kind of see one headlight. You can tell it was red. Other than that, really, there's no telling. Well, we talked about Go, go Topless Day at the beginning of the show, and uh, we're going to story about it. Galveston County officials plan to bolster law enforcement efforts for next year's Go Topless Jeep Weekend after deputies responded to nonstop calls for service and vehicle collisions at this year's event. The event typically attracts hundreds of Jeep owners to Crystal Beach, but this year's crowd appeared to be the largest in more than a decade, said Galveston County Sheriff Henry Trochaset. Rumors say that it was partially due to a famous Jeep-related podcast getting the word out, but we are (laughs) unable to confirm those reports at this time. Now, the sheriff uh, had said that deputies responded to nearly 600 calls for service over the weekend. More than 100 people were arrested at the event, and he said about 50 sheriff's office employees worked overtime on Saturday alone. Trotterset said that he is asking the commissioners for at least four additional four-wheel drive vehicles, which would help deputies navigate through the tides for next year's event. He says, quote, part of the issue is the tide, the high tide restricts you from being able to maneuver. That was a big hindrance trying to respond to calls in a timely manner. The sheriff's office was fully staffed over the weekend, so much so they had enough uh, personnel on hand to handle a large event like the 4th of July. But Trotterset said that he'll also discuss the possibility of getting more overtime pay for his employees. He also wants to contract with other outside agencies for next year's Jeep weekend, but the commissioners will likely have the final say. The Galveston County Commissioner's Office said the commissioner has already suggested additional funding for law enforcement and limiting access points to the beach. However, 
There is no way to limit the size of the crowds at Crystal Beach because of the Texas Open Beaches Act law that guarantees free public access to state-owned beaches on the Gulf of Mexico. At this year's event, authorities said that the main issue included minors in possession of alcohol, oh, come on, public intoxication, drunken driving, and vehicle burglary. Several people also suffered severe vehicle-related injuries after falling off of or out of moving Jeeps, he said. And out of the 113 people arrested on the Bolivar Peninsula between Wednesday and Sunday, close to 20 people were charged with not wearing a seatbelt. Just a Class C misdemeanor. And while those charges unto themselves typically don't result in an arrest, Trachisette said that likely it wasn't the deputy's first course of action. But most of that would be a situation where you're on the beach and you have somebody on the hood or on the roof of a vehicle, he said. And how many times do you have to tell them to get back in the vehicle before you take action? That's exactly what happened. Close to 19,000 people have signed a petition calling for the end of the event. But Trotchaset said that the weekend crowds were similar to those before Hurricane Ike. He said newer residents likely weren't familiar with the event's popularity. Pre-Ike, There were weekends where we would arrest 100 people in a single day on the peninsula, he said. So, maybe this wasn't too unusual of an event after all. But, it certainly points out the fact that there are still some bad apples in the bunch that are trying to ruin it for the rest of us. If you or your friends are planning on going next year, do what you can to keep yourselves and those around you safe and acting responsible. If you were at Crystal Beach for this year's Go Topless event and have a story you'd like to share, boy, we want to hear it. Please get in touch with us. We want to hear what you have to say. So, um, you know how I am about the media. Uh, it's mainly the local media for me, but I, I suspect, based on what I've seen, it's uh, it's nationwide. They want to, you know, they're selling a product and they want to uh, make it as sensational as possible. So, I'm really glad to hear that you you read that section where they said it's not unusual for them to uh, arrest a hundred people in a day during other events. Now, right. with that said, uh, reading on Facebook, I have seen uh, people talk about holding their event, uh, their Go Topless event elsewhere next year because they don't want to be associated with this kind of activity. And, mm. I, and I do know, uh, hearsay, that there were uh, situations where the police did not feel comfortable in breaking up uh, drunken uh, vehicle, completely naked women on stripper poles. Seriously. Whoa. Seriously, Whoa. they did not want to go into that because it was two two officers and there was, you know, 25, 30, 40 uh, drunken kids that yeah. were doing this and, and going over there and saying, all right, you kids knock that off. Somebody's going to get shot, killed, probably a deputy. Beer bottle to the dome, pepper yeah. spray, stop resisting. Don't tase me, bro. Yeah. So a lot of what you were talking about there as far as them getting more people out there, more officers out on the beach very critical and i'm hoping they're able to do that Uh, i know for myself personally uh this would keep me from going uh back to the event again because i don't want to get in a situation where i get hurt and i certainly don't want to get in the situation where i have to shoot and kill somebody to protect my life looking at some of the pictures i saw of the crystal beach event at high tide there is no there's no beach there's no beach there's there's I mean, we're talking maybe 30 or 40 feet of beach left. I mean, two or three lanes worth of, of room here between where the water ends and where the beach ends. And, and this is where the event is taking place. Yeah. I can't imagine having tens of thousands of people. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people all on the beach, all on this very narrow strip of sand at high tide. And you throw in things like alcohol and God knows what else into the mix and, you know, sun and heat and testosterone and angst and everything else. And you just, it's a bad mix and people making bad decisions just make that kind of a situation that much worse. Oh, also too, uh, I think you had read uh, in the fr- top part of the story about uh, last year, I mean, the event not having this many people, they may yeah. have had more people this year, but there was literally thousands of uh, maybe tens of thousands of people at the event last year. This is a Jeez. big, this is a big, big event. And I, I would uh, hazard to say that it is the biggest go topless event uh, in the nation. There is so many people that go there. I mean, I was warned by several people last year about uh, how much of a hassle it is just to get there and then get out. Fortunately, we didn't have that problem, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a huge event and I would like to see it uh, made safe 
So all of you that have not experienced, go. Because if you like a parade, it certainly is. Lots of just gorgeous Jeeps driving up and down the beach. All you got to do is sit there. Hmm. Well, it sounds like fun, but it also a recipe for disaster if uh, yes. you know the worst were to happen. Well, if you have a news tip or response to any one of our stories, we sure would like to hear what you have to say. We have a number of ways that you can reach out and tell us what you have to say. Be sure to let us know by phone or by email. Just head over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and find out how to reach out. Hey, coming up a little bit later in the show, we have an interview with Dan Greck, the man who circumnavigated the continent of Africa in a Jeep and from theroadchoseme.com. Coming up in Tech Talk, part two of our used Jeep buying guide. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to this one, Josh. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. Be sure to tell your friends about the 4x4 Radio Network. We know the off-road world is full of more than just Jeeps. So if your buddy wheels a Toyota or a side-by-side, the 4x4 Radio Network website has something for them, too. Tell them to visit 4x4radionetwork.com. Once there, they're going to find shows like the 4x4 podcast, the Center Steer podcast, Trail Chasers, and even the On the Trail podcast. Lots of great off-road shows, and it's all for free. And it's all at 4x4radionetwork.com. We'll see you there. Hey, Jeep Talk Show. It's Brad from PA. Hey, just listening to the last week's episode. Uh, I had a question for Josh. Josh, you said you're finally upgrading your gears. Um, and if I remember correctly, you were running 355s. So my question is, are you also upgrading the carriers, or did you just get the thick uh, gear set? And uh, why you chose which one you did? Uh, that's it, guys. Thanks for the show. Appreciate it. Talk to you later. Well, Brad, thanks for reaching out to the show and always glad to answer questions, especially when they're tech related. Uh, my gear specifically, yes, in my uh, Dana 30 and uh, high pinion Dana 30 and 29 spline Chrysler eight and a quarter rear axle. Um, they are running the 355 gears in, in there. Um, I didn't really have a choice as to what gears I wanted to go with. Uh, well, I, I did have a choice as what what I wanted to go with, but what I got, I really didn't have a choice. And that's pretty much because of the way that the deal worked out. Um, I had a buddy who was leaving a very popular four-wheel uh, parts store, uh, off-road store and, and stuff, and, and he was um, on his way out. And before he left, he decided to give me the deal of the century. Uh, so I got what I got, and I got what I got. So um, I got G2. Uh, performance series uh, gears, uh, 456 gears, uh, and the installation kits. Yes, I do have to replace the carrier up in the front. Anytime you are working on a Dana 30 uh, and you are doing anything larger than 355 gears, uh, starting at 373 and up, you do need to replace the carrier. Not so much as an upgrade, is as a properly sized carrier for that size of ring gear. Uh, and that's what it's all about. I could not hook up that ring gear to the stock carrier uh, because, well, it's just the wrong diameter. Uh, so, yeah, there there is an option here to uh, go with uh, something aftermarket. Uh, there is a Dana Spicer option. Yukon makes an option as well. There are a few other options out there as well. But, yes, the carrier in the front is going to have to be upgraded. The rear carrier, however, is fine. Uh, and that will also be getting a, uh, a a locker during the install as well. I already have one up front, so yeah, good times. Did you already have the locker, or are you good buying that uh, before no, you install? No, actually, I've been sitting on that for probably close to a year. That okay. was another Craig, so that's the Craigslist one. purchase, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, they're both uh, automatic lockers, right? Correct, uh, yeah. So I have a, a basically a Spartan up front, even although... Some of it has been custom made. Uh, that was a Craigslist purchase. It didn't have a center pin, and the uh, the uh, the two spacer sleeves were um, had a lot of stress cracks and fractures. Oh. So basically, I uh, I machined a set of those out of tool steel, uh, and and had those treated and everything, and that's that's been working fine and great ever since. Now I've got a uh, is it a True Track? And I'm brain farting on a Power Track. Power. I'm brain farting on the locker. True Track sounds we're, familiar. That's not be what it is. Um, so it's like, like I said, it's been sitting on a shelf for a year. I haven't even looked at it in months. Um, but uh, I got that off of a off of a, a guy who was using a, a Cherokee as a, a male Jeep, 
Uh, he had upgraded to a JKU, uh, was parting out the Cherokee, and uh, in like I think five weeks prior, he had put this locker in. Oh, wow. uh, and yeah, I mean he he had like less than five hundred miles on it. He said. Um, and yanked it out, showed me the receipt. The receipt was like three months old. Uh, it was like, it's like, okay, uh, here's the money. Yeah, you take my money, uh, sort of thing. But uh, yeah, that'll be going into the rear um, at the same time as the gears, at the same time as a rebuild kit, new bearings, new seals. And I'm going to be doing a disc brake upgrade as well. So a lot going on on that rear axle all at once. You know, Josh, I'm thinking while you're in there. No. Yeah, I'm that's pretty much it, man. That's pretty much it. <laughs> no, while you're in there, you might as well put this locker. You might as well go ahead and do the disc brake upgrade. Next thing you know, the Jeep's red and all hell's breaking loose. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not happening. <laughs> Shut up and listen. Shut up. Shut up. So shut up. You don't shut up. Shut up, Shane. Hey. (laughs) Shut up and listen. It's time for Wrangler talk. It's time for G Mama. It's time to clean up your room, you young brats. (laughs) Uh huh. Yeah, I know. Some people, you know, don't believe in cleaning your Jeep. They believe Jeeps are meant to be dirty. And yes, they are meant to get dirty, but not to stay dirty. You need to protect your Jeep, especially. If you're, you know, take your Jeep to the ocean or there's road salt or the mud or anything, you really, really, really need to clean it just to keep it long lasting and to protect all those Jeep parts. So, you know, I know you all think I'm a clean freak, which I kind (laughs) of am. And I recently did a video on my top five clean hacks for your Jeep Wrangler. Um, And I thought I would share them with you on the Jeep Talk Show here. And especially, and you know what, I was thinking the other night, and I'm like so surprised Tony or Nikki G never said that my Jeep was red when I was in Uari, because (laughs) there was red clay all over it. It kind of looks, when it gets wet, it's more orange. Just knowing that you were worried about it is enough for me, Tammy. (laughs) Oh, there you go. So... Actually, the little neighbor girl who loves my Jeep, she thought I painted my wheels orange, um because it was just covered in that that red clay. Anyway, my top five Jeep packs. One thing you can do, especially with the road salt or the salt from the ocean, um, is put the sprinkler, you know, the ones that go back and forth, like the old-fashioned ones from when we were growing up, put that underneath your Jeep and let it just spray out the undercarriage. That's a good, um, simple way to do it instead of, you know, going to the the car wash. Um, another thing for inside, now the, this is the Jeep Wranglers. I'm not sure what year they started where the, the frames um, have holes in them. And I didn't even know you could do this, but if you put your hose in there, you would not believe the yuck that comes out. Um, shut up, Tony. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, my God. I lost my train of thought. I thought it was a great idea. I didn't know there was a hole that you could throw the the garden hose in there. Put your your hose in the hole. Yeah. Um, The other other thing is when I get in and out of my Jeep, when I'm out on the trails, I'm stepping in mud, and then you step on that that little door part. There's a little, little plastic part, and you're just constantly getting mud there, and I never could get it clean. Um, even just wash soap and water didn't work, but I decided to try the Mr. Clean Magic Erasers, and those seem to take up most of that mud. So that's another hack. That's number three. Number four is once you get your undercarriage nice and clean, use the fluid film. I know we've t- said mentioned this before on the talk show, um, but that fluid film is like this greasy lube stuff that protects the undercarriage it keeps the salt from eating away at your jeep so sprinkler fluid film mr clean erasers the hose and my favorite one of all time i know i've talked about this several times on my fenders my plastic fenders on my rubicon they get mud spots and i i was trying everything to try to get rid of them i even tried peanut butter because somebody suggested it don't do things 
um, just because someone suggested on the internet. <laughs> Think first, because then I had squirrels all over my fenders. Um, so tire foam, you know, the like the armor all has tire foam. Mother's has tire foam. It's the stuff that is kind of like Mr. Bubble. It gets white like that. Spray it on your fenders. Let it, the foam start to clear and then take a microfiber cloth and just wipe it down so you don't have the drip marks. Do that to all four fenders. And then that microfiber cloth is full of, it's like wet, full of this stuff. Take it on the interior of your Jeep, the plastic dash, and use that. And I think it works way better than Under Armour. The tire foam works awesome on the fenders, getting rid of all those spots. Um, so those are my top five clean hacks for your Jeep Wrangler. And seriously, folks, you really should get the mud off your Jeeps. Get that nasty road salt off your Jeep. Get that ocean salt off your Jeep if you want it to last longer so you have more fun, longer fun. So there you go. So Tammy, I know I've asked you this before. I just don't remember what the answer is. Um, have you considered, uh, or have maybe even looked into getting a undercoating on your Jeep, like Linex or uh, Rhino? Well, I guess Rhino liner is really kind of a bed liner, but uh, you know, one of the things that really keeps the salt off of all the under uh, the metal components underneath your Jeep. Right. Um, I've never looked into it. I think it would probably be pricey, but I'm not sure. Um, I just keep um, sanding the spots and spraying it with um, oh, just the your black bu- spray paint. Yeah, it's just your bumper that that, that, that you're talking about, though. You don't yeah. you don't do anything to the oh, the I, axle and the do, or do you? I when I get under I get underneath my Jeep and those skid plates. Yeah, I will sand down as best I can and then spray. Actually, I started using the Osfo. Um, that I talked about, O S P H O. I'll use that on the rust, the scrape spots and the rust spots, and then I'll let that dry for 24 hours, and then I'll use the Rust-Oleum black spray paint underneath my Jeep. So yes. let me let me make the suggestion because I know uh, that I'm sure there's people out there that would like to know about the uh, Linex, for example. Why don't you see if there's a, a local Linex uh, company that you can call and call them up and say hi. Uh, uh, my name's Tammy. You may know me as Jeep uh, Mama on the very yeah. popular uh, Jeep Talk Show, uh, actually called Jeep Talk Show. And I was uh, calling about getting a uh, a sweet deal price or or just what your price is. <laughs> no, but I think it'd be interesting to find out, even if right. it's not something you're going to go with. And and you may find right. out that it's a lot cheaper than what uh, than what you thought. You may not want to go with it. it. Cheap is relative, but right. uh, might be an interesting thing for uh, for our audience. Definitely, I'll have to check into that. And coming up later in the show, we're going to be hearing from Nikki G. Really? This is going to be a weekly thing with him. I know. What is up? For years, guys. <laughs> hey, it's been a long time since I checked our uh, for Apple podcast uh, for our reviews. And you know what? Well, this one did come I, in a little I, while ago, didn't I it? I found the new one. Yeah, there's a couple before this one, too. <laughs> the, but we'll get to those in uh, uh, future episodes. So this one's uh, from Scott S. Uh, he says... White Jeep's rule. Uh, obviously, woo, he's woo. been had a, a blow to the head or something. Uh, I'm from Montana, and uh, I'm a Jeep freak. I love, live, and breathe Jeeps. <laughs> really some uh, good inhale problems or power there. Uh, <laughs> that said, Montana is not the place to find out, uh, find info on anything. It's like a geographic oddity. We are weeks away from every part I have ever needed <laughs> <laughs> it sounds oh, like Wayne suck. down in uh, New Zealand. <laughs> so keeping up on uh, uh, keeping up to date on Jeep events uh, and new gizmos is like non-existent. Your very informative guests are great as well uh, as links to all the goodies. Love some of the other podcasts you have uh, on your show. I'm sure he's talking about the network, the Four by Four Radio Network. Thanks for keeping up uh, us up to date on everything Jeep. Love it, love it. And did I mention I love it? Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the five star review there on uh, Apple Podcasts, formerly called uh, Apple iTunes. You got tech questions? Ah, oh, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good because I, I it's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. Yahoo! 
Now, last week, we started this tech series with the fundamentals of used Jeep buying. I covered three key points of preparedness that will make buying a used Jeep a, a lot easier. Mental, physical, and logistical preparation makes all the difference in the world in just about everything, including buying a Jeep. This week, I promised we'd get into the specifics of one of the most critically useful tips in used vehicle purchases, and that's a used vehicle inspection done by a certified mechanic. If the seller isn't willing to let the vehicle be inspected, just simply walk away. That's honestly the best piece of advice I can give to anybody looking to buy a used vehicle of any kind. But to set your mind at ease that the money you're going to be spending for an inspection is going to good use, we're going to go into the specifics of what a used vehicle inspection is and what it covers. Nearly all auto repair shops from big name chains to dealerships to independent garages offer some type of pre-purchase inspection at a cost that is typically about a hundred bucks, give or take. Here's another tip. Having a hundred dollar bill to wave around underneath that mechanic's nose will have that mechanic considering a much lower price if it's a cash transaction and the amount on the sign says higher than a hundred bucks. Be warned though, this will work a lot easier at an independent shop more than it will at a dealership. Those guys are going to be kind of locked into policies. Most repair facilities will give a written description of the number of points covered in the inspection, as typically more than 100 points of inspection, and a detailed description of how it's conducted. Keep in mind, though, that in most cases, the findings of inspections are not guaranteed, and there will be no repairs made. Okay, so what does an inspection do exactly? Well, a used vehicle inspection performed by a certified mechanic verifies the functioning of all vehicle equipment, including every option on the vehicle, every signal, light, button, knob, and switch is tested and its function verified. The entire vehicle is, is inspected from top to bottom. The report will tell you what the overall condition of the Jeep and its sub subsystems are, including such things as tire wear, the condition of the brake pads, how much life is left in the coolant or the battery, and whether or not the AC and the heat are working properly. And that's the big key here. It's the difference of something just working and it working properly. That AC is no good if it shuts off and overheats the vehicle after 15 minutes of driving. This level of inspection will also reveal hidden problems within the body, the frame, or the engine. Mechanics will check trouble codes that can reveal mechanical or electrical problems that may not have been easily diagnosed or have been hidden. A detailed inspection also builds confidence in the value of the vehicle. You're going to know for sure if the price that the seller is asking fits the Jeep that they're trying to sell. Aside from small things like a burnout light in the seat heater button or a failing O2 sensor, a used vehicle inspection can also reveal evidence of more severe problems in the present or that happened in the past. Things like frame damage, for instance. If the frame shows damage, it indicates the Jeep has been in a serious accident. This alone might be good enough reason to just walk away. Oftentimes repaired correctly or not, a Jeep that was in a wreck will likely have some issues pop up in the future, if it doesn't have some already. Unless it has been repaired correctly, doors may not seal properly, body lines may be crooked, the wheels may not track properly, causing the vehicle to pull to one side and lead to premature tire wear and poor steering performance. Poor, uh, poor previous repair work will also be found. This could range from improper engine service to sloppy body work or even improper installation of accessories or modifications. You'd hate to buy a used lifted Jeep thinking it's the perfect rig only to find out the lift kit was installed with bubblegum and duct tape and it's not much more than a nice looking death trap. Imagine not knowing about previous flood or fire damage either. A vehicle history report can red flag a car that has been in a flood or fire, unless its title has been falsified that is, and this happens more than you'd think. You might not spot the fake title even, but an inspector can easily identify the telltale signs of damage, even if it's been hidden. Other issues an inspection can reveal include hidden rust, fluid leaks, suspicious odors, and overdue maintenance procedures, all of which can either force you in a different direction or give you loads of good reasons to negotiate a lower price. Typically, the repair shop will also give you an estimate of what it will cost to repair anything that pops up, and working with the seller, you might even have them make the repairs if they're willing, bad chance, or at least they'll drop the asking price by the repair amount. That's going to be more likely. Next week, we're going to get into how to choose who does your inspection. We'll go over the pros and cons and options of using a mobile mechanic service and even cover the wide world of online Jeep buying. So, Josh, let me know if this uh, uh, jumps on something that you're going to talk about uh, right. next week and uh, I, mm -hmm. can, uh, I can take this out. Um, I have found, now, keep in mind, I don't deal with a lot of mechanics uh, because yeah. I'd, I'd like doing my own, my own work, not, not for the fun, believe me. But just because, 
<laughs> just because I like the one doing it. But I have run across uh, mechanics that are, are very, very good at their job, but they don't know Jeeps. So if you take, uh, take your, your Jeep to have them have a look at it, they may not know what the common issues with Jeeps are, especially depending on uh, the, uh, the engine that's in it and the transmission and the transfer case, high opinion as, a, as opposed to low opinion, data 30, et cetera, et cetera. Have, have you seen similar type things uh, like what I'm talking about here? I mean, it, it would you may get a, a thumbs up from a mechanic and he just doesn't know. So, yes, um, this doesn't really step on what we're going to be talking about next week uh, because I'm going to use an anecdote from a personal story um, with my own Jeep, uh, something that happened to me recently, in fact, uh, and even here kind of relates to the show a little bit. Now, uh, a couple of few years ago, uh, I was going through a rebuild of, uh, of, of the engine and the transfer case, and I needed a lot of head work done on the head for my Jeep. And uh, the cylinder head uh, needed to go into a shop. It needed to be rebuilt, machined. There was there, a lot of work needed to be done. I called around and I talked with several shops. And I even went in and talked with a couple of people. And it, it, it wasn't until I actually spent some time on the phone talking with these people before just taking it to the closest shop to my house. Because there is right. one less than a two-minute drive from my house, but that's not the one I went with. And the reason why is because they didn't know Jeeps. Right. Now, the shop that I did end up going to, I talked with them. They knew Jeeps. They were an AMC Chrysler Jeep specialist. That, that was primarily what they did. Now, they, of course, they did other things as well, but these guys knew Jeep. And in talking with them and talking about my build, where I was at with things, and what I was hoping to get out of a head rebuild, I got some information from them that led me to make that choice. Now, when you're calling up mechanic shops or calling up dealers or service centers or whatever, you're going to be talking with people. Likely you're not going to be talking with a mechanic unless it's one of those independent shops uh, and it's, you know, self-proprietor type of thing. Probably only has a couple of guys working there. Likely you're going to be talking with a receptionist, um, somebody who doesn't know vehicles very well, uh, might know the industry a little bit, but whatever. Ultimately, you're going to want to talk to, me to a mechanic. And even though he may or may not know Jeeps, if you develop a bit of a rapport with the guy, instead of just barking out a couple of questions at, at him or whatever, <laughs> uh, you, might, you might be able to get them to tell you who in the industry is the Jeep expert who does used vehicle inspections. It might be as simple as taking it to your local four-wheel parts store or your off-road store. They may know somebody. They may have a mechanic service in the back. You know, I, Really, it's going to come down to doing some homework. I yeah. know nobody likes doing that. And I know a lot of people really don't like spending time on the phone, especially when you're not getting anywhere. But unfortunately, when you're making the second largest purchase of your life, you're going to have to do a little bit of homework to make sure that you don't get taken advantage of. Yep. Well, if you have anything to add or maybe you have a question that you would like addressed here on Tech Talk, just jump over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and send us a message. Who knows? Maybe you'll have your question answered here on the show. The Jeep Talk Show. It's not about us. It's about you, the listeners. It's Tim from Torrance. Hey, Jeepers. This is uh, Rob from San Antonio, Hey, guys. It's Cody with TrailChasers.net with another grand adventure. Hey, guys. This is Cody from Indiana. yoo Hello, Jeep Talk Show crew. This is FJ Rick. Hi, guys. This is Joe. If a turtle doesn't have a shell, is he naked or homeless? Hey, guys. This is Ron out in Arizona. Hey, hey, what's up? Jeep Talk Show. This is Jason, Oregon Trail Off-Road. Hi, this is Jake from California, and I'm sitting here eating pork rinds for breakfast. Hey, this is uh, PA Geek Free. Hey, Tony, Josh, Danny, it's like today, Jake calling. This is John, I'm Free Runner in 1982, and on today's radio contact segment, I'm going to talk about APRS, an anal probe restraint system. No! No, 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 no that's not right. We love our listeners. <laughs> Lord knows. Once you get it in there, you don't want it falling out. Good Lord. <laughs> From around the world. Or from your city. And sometimes just down the street. Howdy, neighbor. It's the Jeep Talk Show interview. All right, boys and girls, you know it's time. You've heard the intro. It's time for another great 
uh, Jeep Talk Show interview. And, I can't uh, wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> don't, don't give it away, Tammy. And, yeah. uh, you know, we've, we've had Dan, uh, Dan Greck, uh, on the show uh, several times before. I think this is uh, your third time here, Dan. And uh, if you don't recall, Dan uh, took a, a nice uh, 2011 uh, Jeep Wrangler on a trek around Africa. And, and when I say around, the only way you could get more around Africa is if you were in a boat cruising around the outside of it. So <laughs> we have a, a lot to talk to Dan about, uh, a lot to catch up on, and uh, we, we have a very short amount of time to do it. So we're just going to jump right into it. Dan, thank you very much for making time for the Jeep Talk Show again. Oh, you're so welcome. It's always a pleasure. So, Dan, I guess the biggest thing here, uh, and I happen to see this on uh, Instagram, you were actually putting your uh, beloved uh, Jeep Wrangler, the one that you had to count on for over 50,000 miles uh, uh, trekking through Africa, in a shipping container the other day. What, what happened? Was it under warranty repair or something? <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. You know, um, I reached the end of the expedition. Uh, oh, the, my the, goodness. <laughs> the dream all along was to drive right to the pyramids in Egypt. Um, and I did that, and it was, uh, awesome. it was really it was really surreal. It was something I dreamed of for a very long time. Um, and then I drove a little bit further north to a town called Alexandria on the coast in Egypt, and it took about a week and a half of the most bureaucratic paperwork intense <laughs> ridiculousness you can possibly imagine. Uh, and then I sealed the Jeep in a shipping container and and it vanished. Uh, yeah, so it was a, a really surreal and bizarre moment. And also it was, it was really, I was sad to see it just sort of vanish all of a sudden. There was no Jeep anymore. There was just a steel box. Now, if you can disclose your location, where are you now? Believe it or not, I'm actually in sunny California uh, and it's raining. It's not sunny California at all. <laughs> <laughs> California probably- is sad for you, Dan. That's what it is. Yeah. Well, I, I just drove here from Arizona where it was snowing and I thought, oh, I'm so ready for some warm weather. And it's not. Didn't you have enough warm weather for three years? Sure. You would have thought so, but it only took about two days of snow for me to have had enough of snow. Right, right. So, I mean, you you drive up to these pyramids. Are you, I mean, what was, were you sad? Were you relieved that it was over? Or, I mean, what was going through your mind? Uh, I definitely wasn't sad. Um, I was elated. I was shaking with excitement. I was kind of pinching myself and it was, it was one of those things where I was almost watching myself, you know, from outside of myself. Right. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, the last couple of months, like, turned into a bit of a hard slog. So, I was, I was elated and I, I was right. sort of in disbelief that I really had done it. And all right. of those, I mean, years and years of hard work ha- had all, you know, I achieved my goal. I really, I did it. And it was, it was kind of shocking to realize that. So, you weren't, like, sad that it was all over. You were kind of probably like, oh. I've, I've done it. I can go back to my home and start my life um, again. I, I mean, I'm definitely sad that I'm going to miss a lot of things about Africa and a lot of things about life on the road. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm really excited to get started on the next chapter of my life and, and move on to new and bigger and better things. I mean, what is, do you know what you have planned or do you have any plans right now? Dan, can we tell them about uh, the, the deal with SpaceX, uh, that you're actually yeah. going to be traveling to the moon? <laughs> yeah, I wish. Me and Elon, we're, we're just keeping <laughs> up together on that. <laughs> um, my plan for the summer, Tammy, is I'm going to be touring a bunch of Jeep and Overland shows. Um, and so I was just at Overland Expo in Flagstaff, Arizona. Oh, okay. And, and, mm, I'm off to Bantam Jeep Fest. I'm off to Northwest Overland Rally, BC Overland Rally. So a whole bunch of them all throughout the summer. Um, which kind of means, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just still on my trip. You know, I'm, right. I'm still just driving the Jeep and living in it and cooking out of it. And so I guess it's, it's a little bit of a denial of reality. Um, and then by the time winter comes around, I'm going to have to come up with a plan. And currently, there is no plan. Well, that's, that's a good plan for now, I guess. Hey, if you <laughs> ever get over to the East Coast this summer, let me know and I'll come try to see you. That would be amazing. Yeah, we should definitely try and uh, get out wheeling somewhere. Didn't, yes. you, didn't you just say Bantam? Isn't that, the, isn't that over there on the East Coast? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's in, it's in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And then, yeah. and then I'll also be at Toledo Jeep Fest. Oh, um, okay, yeah. And then Overland Expo East is down in Virginia this year. And I'm, oh. I'm, on, the, I'm on the fence. I haven't locked that one in yet. So I'll, I'll keep you updated. 
Good Lord, Tammy, not driving, pulling into your driveway, but that's pretty damn close. I know. The Bantam Jeep Fest is like five hours for me, but okay. that weekend that weekend is bad for me. But mm. let me see what I can figure out. That would be cool. So, now, it makes sense, but let's just make sure you're, you're driving the same Jeep that you had in Africa. That's what you're driving around the country in, and that's what you're going to these uh, uh, Jeep events in. That's exactly right, Tony. Yep. So I noticed that you've got a got the three point eight in that uh, that Jeep, which has had some issues. It's kind of a random thing. Did you have any problems with yours? No, actually, uh, everything engine wise has been completely untouched. I have never done anything to it, and it has never let me down. Excellent. I love hearing that. That's kind of be, seemed to be the thing, and it really depends on uh, where it was put together. Is uh, seems to be the uh, the issue with the, the three point eight liter. Uh, very hit and miss type thing. I saw that when I was looking at your uh, configuration of your Jeep and all the goodies that you have in there. Um, and, you know, I almost, I'm almost certain I've asked this question before, and I don't recall the answer. Uh, was there something that you put in your Jeep, like maybe not the lockers or any of those things? Those things are, are quite necessary for what you were doing. But the Overland stuff that you needed, was there anything that you thought you were going to need and you really didn't use it that much? Um. Probably the main thing is when I designed my interior cabinets, I made it uh, so it's possible that I can turn it into a big flat surface and I can actually just sleep in the back of the Jeep without opening the roof. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that would be really handy. You know, if I didn't feel safe or whatever, I could just go to sleep in the back and, and leave the roof down. But actually, I only did it twice on the entire trip. Um, it just it didn't turn out to be necessary. So. I think that's probably the major thing that I thought would be useful, but turned out not to be. Did it uh, turn out to be any kind of uh, a help of a like a table to work on? Like maybe if you were doing some some maintenance, or maybe you had some parts out that you needed to work on, did you use it as a big, like a big table? No, not like that. The the way that it works is kind of the cabinets dismantle, and just the whole back of the Jeep is then one big flat surface. Oh, okay. but it's re- but it's really inconvenient because then you can't get into any of the cabinets because they're they're all blocking each other. So, was there anything that you wish you would have had that you didn't? You know, there was only a couple of things from time to time, and none of them were major at all. Like, um, right. I've been going a few months when I realized I really wanted a knife sharpener. Oh, um, so, I, yeah. so, I kept my eyes out for a long time, and I found one. Like, it, it's the kind of thing, if you look around long enough, you will find something. Right. Um, I broke a Nalgene bottle at one point, and then so I, I kept my eyes out for months and months and months. I never did find one, so I just decided I didn't need it. <laughs> um, so really only minor things like that. Certainly, you know, nothing nothing fundamental. And what about what was your, I'm sure you probably have hundreds of memorable moments, but what was your one thing, if you could pick one thing that you, like, was the best? Oh, one thing. I thought you were just going to say the, the strongest memory, but the oh, okay. best memory. I mean... Overall, no doubt about it, the best thing is is how friendly the people were and how I have all of these memories of just sort of, you know, pulling in somewhere, hoping to find somewhere to camp and maybe it's on dusk and it's been a really long day, I'm tired. You, you always feel a little bit scared when night's coming and you're not sure, am I going to be safe, you know, have I done a dumb thing driving in here, you know, and I have these strong, strong memories of complete strangers just coming up to me and shaking my hand and saying, you are welcome, you can camp right here, it's no problem, you know. My, wow. my house is here, you can you can camp next to my house and, and these are my children, you know. And just the, the way that people, and, and I think that happened more than 100 times on the whole trip. And, and at those moments, you know, I was kind of scared, I was alone, I was a bit worried. And to have them behave that way, I mean, it, it nearly brought me to tears on so many occasions. Yeah, I remember reading some of your posts several times about, the people and how warm and welcoming they were. I think, um, I think Tammy, we, we like to think that we're friendly, you know, in, in Canada or Australia where I'm originally from. But I've realized now it's just sort of like a surface level, you know, hi, how are you? Or, you know, thank you when you buy something in the shop. Mm-hmm. Whereas in, in Africa, people, are, the kindness is so much deeper than that. It's like, how can I help you? Like, come into my house, eat some food, right. have, have a warm place to sleep, I think is... It's a different type of warmth than, than what we're used to in the West. Now, this is probably an ignorant question. Uh, do you get the feeling they are like that because living in Africa is so much more difficult than it is here? Uh, I know you've mentioned that uh, coming to the coming to the States, it's just 
so many convenient things that you didn't have while you were uh, in Africa. I, I kind of wonder if maybe that's how they survive over there is that they help each other uh, uh, through the night almost. Absolutely, Tony. You just hit the nail on the head. That's impressive. I think that's 100% <laughs> what it is. They, they, they have to help each other, otherwise they wouldn't get through it. They wouldn't survive. And I really felt that um, when I was in the Congo, there was lots of cars stuck in the mud and, you know, trucks and they were really stuck, you know, and, and every time I tried to help them, they would stick out their hands and, and in French, they would say, we are together, you know, and shake hands. And it was this real thing of like, suddenly now we're all down on the same level. We're all up to our knees in mud. We're all pushing this car. We're all in this struggle together, but together we can, we can get through it. Um, and so, yeah, I think Africans know that they're only strong because they're together. So what, um, what is like the scariest moment you had? Uh, um, scariest animals, scariest people or scariest Jeep incident? I think the people are always the most scariest, but I'll let Tammy uh, go with uh, what she wants. Um, my, my guess would be your scariest people would be one of those border crossings. You know, actually, the border crossings were never a problem. They, and I always tried to arrive in the daylight, which I think is a, a big piece of advice for anyone going international. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, no, the borders were not scary. Like, huh. you know, nobody ever pointed a gun at me. Nobody ever threatened to arrest me. Nothing like that at all. Um, lots of patience is needed, you know, and people are asking for money and you, you play the bribery game. But no, no, I was, I was never scared at a border, not even once. Really, that for me, that would be my biggest fear. Um, you know, something that I think Hollywood has messed with our brains a bit is we have these images of, of these guys in uniform who are going around shooting people or terrorizing people. And th the reality is that the military over there, they are professional soldiers just the same as the military is here. And they uh -huh. take their jobs very seriously. They're very highly trained. It's their career. It's how they put food on the table. And so... Not in a million years are they going to like brandish their gun or point it at someone or, or God forbid, actually shoot someone unnecessarily. I mean, that they would go to jail for the rest of their lives, just the right. same as just the same as someone in the military would here. Um, so, in fact, when, whenever the military were around and you know they're armed to the teeth, I felt really safe. You know, they're, they're professional soldiers doing their job. Right. They have absolutely no interest in hurting me whatsoever. So then, what was your scariest people moment? scariest people moment was uh, actually a misunderstanding. Um, I was in Cameroon and they were very close to civil war at the time. Oh, and I was in the region where that was kind of happening and the, the English speaking were thinking about fighting the French speaking and it was tense. And I was wild camping in the bush and I guess I got spotted. And so in the middle of the night, bang, bang, bang on the side of the Jeep, get out of the car, police. Uh, and so I came out, it was pitch black and I had flashlights in my face, so I couldn't see very well. Uh, but I came out with my hands in the air and, you know, within two or three minutes, kind of everything relaxed. But what happened then was men started coming out of the, the woods and all of them were armed with their rifles oh, out. Oh, my goodness. And so I, I couldn't see them, but I very much suspect as I was getting out of the Jeep, they were pointing guns at me. Um, wow. But yeah, and I mean, they just didn't know who I was. I was this big unknown quantity out there in the woods in this sort of right. military-ish looking vehicle. And in the end, it was totally fine. They took me back to their police station. They checked me out. And actually, at the end of it all, the, the man in charge, he shook my hand and he said, I'm really sorry for the trouble. You know, I had to check you out. Um, oh, and if you'd like, you can camp right here in our compound. It's no problem. Oh, of course. Yeah, so I, I mean- know. They're professional soldiers. They they had to do their job and check me out. Um, right. and, and I don't, you know, I don't begrudge them that at all. I I think they did a very professional job. Yeah, still, that's got to be a little nerve wracking. Uh, uh, no lights and then uh, awakened out of a sleep like that. This had to have been rough. It was, yeah. And, and, you know, they bang on the car and they say police. You're like, yeah, but oh, is it really yeah. the police? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. yeah, that was exactly yeah. what but, I was thinking. It's like, well, of course you're going to say that, so hopefully you don't shoot me. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was just looking at some of the stuff here on your, your site, theroadchoseme.com. Uh, it says, African miles driven, fi 52,000, man, 5,000, you wish, 52,580, uh, 999 days. Dan, not 1,000. It couldn't be 1,000. I mean, that this sounds like a great title for a book. <laughs> I'm just checking up on that. That 52,000, I'm sure that's wrong. Um, you're right. I'm reading it off the screen, but if I go to this other page, 
Yeah, the total is actually 53,726. Um, so I'm, thanks, I need to update that. Um, and, and what happened with the 999 days? I put the Jeep in the shipping container in Egypt, like we talked about. I, I went back to where I was staying and I tried to book a plane flight, but there were none for that night. So I booked one for the following day. And so, you know, plane flight booked, that's it, I'm leaving Africa, everything's finished. And then I went online to one of those online calculators where you put in, I put in the date I landed in Morocco, I put in the date of my plane flight, which was the next day, oh. and it spat out 999. Yeah. So, <laughs> and actually, I had, leading up to that, I guess I hadn't really been keeping track. Like, I knew it was just short of three years, but I didn't, I didn't know how close to 1,000 it actually was. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize that you didn't, you weren't keeping track of it. Um, so, 35 countries visited. Now, I noticed uh, that uh, on the little map uh, on your uh, the roadshowsme.com site, it shows that you have gone all around Africa. So, it's almost like you followed the coast in, in a lot of the places, uh, but you didn't hit the north part of Africa. What was, you know, again, my ignorance as far as uh, politics and uh, how the rest of the world works. Why didn't you? Why didn't you travel on the north part? I mean, I see a little dotted line there, but I'm assuming that mm. that isn't though that you didn't traverse that area with the jeep. Right. Yeah. The, the dotted line was my planned route before I set out. Um, but what's going on right now in the north there in Libya? They're still very much at war, um, and so the borders are just completely closed. It's it's uh, an impossibility to get a visa to be able to travel to Libya, um, and even if I could manage to get one somehow the Egyptian military would never have let me get close to the border. Um, Egypt are pretty serious about protecting tourists, and so they work hard on not letting you go anywhere that's even slightly dangerous. Um, and so even if I had tried to get near the border of Libya, they, they would have stopped me and turned me around. Gotcha. Yeah, um, I saw that, and I went. I, I just knew that you were going, the, the plan was to go around pretty much all the outside of Africa. And actually looking at this map, I see that you were in the interior of Africa a lot more than what I thought you would be. Uh, was that just because that was the the best route to go or the most interesting route to go? How, how did that, did that change or was that always your plan? Uh, that was always the plan. That, that part that you're talking about there is probably looking at Burundi, Uganda, Rwanda. Um, they're great little countries and, and I always wanted to get there. So, and, and my plan from the very beginning, it wasn't just to sort of drive the minimum distance. Uh, but it also wasn't like to see every single country. It was to see as much as possible while staying within my comfort level of safety. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there were some countries where I just explored to my heart's content, literally the same as I would in Alaska, you know, driving anything that the Jeep would go down. Uh, and then there were other countries where I sort of just hustled from one end to the other, you know, not lingering and not exploring the backwoods because I didn't feel so comfortable and so safe. Well, then you were concerned about your safety, and you did adjust your your trajectory to to make it as safe for you as possible. And and you and you weren't alone in this uh, for the entire trip. So you had the safety of uh, others to to be concerned with as well. That's right. Yes. Sometimes I was teaming up with other vehicles, and we were convoying. Um, and then for part of the trip, my girlfriend came along as well. And so yeah, that's right. These are all things to consider. Um, and you do you have to adapt as you're moving because things change so rapidly. So, uh, looking at this uh, this trek, are there any loops in here, or is that well? I guess there is one loop. Uh, I'm just trying to make out this uh, um, the state. It's on the east coast, about the middle of Africa. Uh, oh, so there's there's definitely a lot of loops, Tony. There was there was a lot of times where I literally, you know, looped back around and drove through the same town. Um, there was a couple of times I I drove back into a country that I'd already left. Um, it was really about just. When I'd talk to locals or I'd talk to embassy staff, they would say, you know, you really have to go and see this waterfall or you really should get into this corner of this national park. Or, And so, I would just sort of pull out a map and start scribbling and inevitably, you're going to backtrack to do that and, yeah. and that's, all, that's all part of it. That's all like I'm happy that I did that. Well, it makes sense. I, I didn't I'd even consider that. But of course, you know, you're, you're talking to the locals and the, everybody's always really impressed with certain things. And if they, if they like you, they want you to, uh, to experience that same joy that they have by looking at it. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Like, you're going to go see a waterfall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when I drove into Zambia, actually, I, I kind of only thought I'd be in Zambia for a week or two. I didn't know much about it. And the very first night, I stayed in a campground right by Victoria Falls. And the guy running it was like, I've lived here my whole life. 
So we pulled out the big map of Zambia and just started circling things and saying like, this is really cool. This is the best thing I've ever been wow. to. Get here. Yeah, and, and so 20 minutes later, we've got this map with all these things all over it. And then he's like, here, yeah, you can have the map. Have a good trip. And it was like, oh, he just mapped out like the most amazing four weeks right. exploration <laughs> in Zambia wow. you could ever hope to find. Yeah, it was great. So I know that if you're traversing through the uh, the United States, there's like uh, huge balls of string or the the largest uh, aluminum foil, foil uh, aluminum foil ball uh, to mankind. Was there anything silly and very local uh, that you ran across while you were uh, uh, in Africa that was something like that? Something kind of cornballish. Oh, that's a good question. I imagine there must be in the touristy places like Kenya and uh, Tanzania. Um, the one that springs to mind is the equator crossing. There's always, you know, they kind of have a globe mounted <laughs> and there's there's guys there who do like the word, water swirling thing and lots of people trying to sell you trinkets and plaques. Um, oh, but, but in you, terms of- you had, to have of like, bought, you had to have bought something at the equator. I mean, that's pretty cool. I didn't even think about crossing the equator. That is, I mean, how many people actually get to do that? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of a bizarre feeling actually. And, and I've done it three times now. So, I- I, I still am like pinching myself that that happened because it, it always is like a big milestone on the trip. Um, and, you know, I didn't buy anything anytime. I kind of, I resist kind of touristy, <laughs> trinkety junk. <laughs> right. I like, to, I like to be in the middle of nowhere in a village where, you know, tourists have never really been before. And then, and then someone has something that they've made and, and they offer it for sale. I, I enjoy that experience a lot more. Oh, sure. No, I, I agree. But I would be, it would be hard for me not to get a little something at the equator, mm. you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it, w- it would be made in China. Tell yeah, me. yeah, it would be. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, um, Dan, I remember seeing your Jeep on its side at one point. Oh, that's right. What, what yeah. happened there? Yeah, that, that is not my proudest moment. Um, I, I guess I'll have to start from the beginning. <laughs> um, so I'd been driving all day and I was exhausted. Another really long day, really hot. And I crested a hill and uh, Lake Albert was in front of me, a big, beautiful lake in Uganda. I was in remote Uganda. And so I thought, oh, I have to get a photo of this. So I parked the Jeep on a bit of a hill. I left it in first gear, turned the engine off, and then I pulled the handbrake. And disclaimer, the handbrake has needed adjusting for a very long time but I haven't done anything about it because <laughs> I'm doing other things. And so I sat in the driver's seat for 10 seconds and the Jeep didn't move at all. I thought, oh, this will be fine, no problem. So I grabbed my camera and I, I walk back about 10 paces. And as I turn around, the Jeep starts to move. Oh, no. And so I, I, I've seen it do this before. It's actually the weight of it can overcome the engine compression. So even though it's in first gear, it's turning over the engine. And when it's done it in the past, it just moves like an inch every few seconds or right. less. Like it's not a big deal. But this time, before I'd even reacted, it had already gone like a Jeep length. Um, and so I started running, but really I had no hope. And so within about five seconds, it traveled maybe maybe five or ten car lengths. And the left front tire, the driver's tire, struck a rock wall. And that massive impact basically kicked it over onto its side And so it smashed down on the passenger side, slid for a couple of yards, and then all just came to a grinding halt. And so here I am, I'm like remote Uganda, nobody around, gravel road, probably no vehicle within 100 miles. And this 6,000 pound Jeep is lying on its side. You know, it's it's been my house for three years. And I, I, yeah, I I mean, that was terrifying. That was ultimately, I thought I ruined the whole trip, but- I actually started thinking like I'm I'm going to climb in there and take my passport out and I'm going to start walking because I don't know what else to do. Um, and I actually, I kind of was denying reality. I didn't want to go over there and look at it. So, I actually just sat on the ground for a few minutes away from it. I didn't, I didn't want to go and almost like see that it was real. Um, yeah, it was a really, really scary moment. Did it, was, was it damaged at all? Anything it's- serious? No, no, it was amazing the way, that, as it always does in Africa, locals started showing up because they heard the big crash. Um, and when I reassured them that nobody was injured, they started sort of saying, oh, then it's fine, big deal, you know, it's just a car. And that really helped me because I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like, it is right. just a car. I mean, it's 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 an important thing to me, but it is still just a car. And so, I got the winch out and I put it across to a tree on a right angle and then they they said that they'd be able to push it up. And I didn't really think that would work because it's so heavy. 
but with 25 or 30 people pushing, they, wow. basically, <laughs> they basically pushed it back up onto the wheels and I just kind of grabbed the slack with the winch. Um, yeah, and it, so it bounced onto its wheels and after a huge cleanup and, I mean, the mirror was smashed off and it's got some good dints and scratches. Other than that, I drove it out of there the next morning and I'm still driving it today, no problem. Well, that had to make you feel really good about uh, driving the Jeep because it, it took that and just kept uh, kept you going on your trip. Exactly right. Yeah, and I, and I like to think that, you know, she wanted to continue the adventure as much as I did, so she wasn't right. going to give up either. Well, she was trying to leave without you. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some people said she just needed a nap. She was a bit tired. Uh-huh. Right. Did, yeah. did everyone clap when the Jeep flipped back over or oh, cheer or anything? I, not really, no. Oh. I, I mean, it was pretty obvious they thought I was an idiot. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but, you know, they were just kind of shaking their heads like, oh, you know, another stupid white guy could work. Right. <laughs> Things uh-huh. flip around here all the time and he's worried about yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, it's funny because, you know, Africans, they're so good at just like solving problems, whatever it is, you know, even even if a truck is stuck up to its axles in mud, like they'll fix it because that's that's what they have to do. And right. so, yeah, vehicle on its side, I'm sure for them, is just like, oh, whatever, it happens. Like, that's what yeah, vehicles we'll just, we'll just flip it back over. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Dan, in a way, I always hate having you on here because it seems like we just get started and then we are all of a sudden we're over the time limit that we have for, uh, for the interviews. And I don't want to keep you. I know you're visiting somebody, uh, somebody's house and we will let you uh, get back to them. But let's tell the kids where they can find, uh, find you on social media. We've mentioned... Uh, uh, several things before. I, I personally enjoy the Instagram the most. For sure, yeah. Um, my Instagram is The Road Chose Me, and I'm also that on YouTube and Facebook. And so I've been putting up a YouTube video from pretty much every country now. And so if you want to really see what Africa looks like just on at the ground level, then uh, my YouTube channel, I think, is a is a pretty good indicator of that. Oh, and speaking of finding out more about the trip, now I know that you've done, you've had the one book. Please remind us of that book. And I believe you're coming out with a, a second one. That's right. I published a book uh, about my Alaska to Argentina trek, and that's called The Road Chose Me, Volume 1. Uh, and then actually, I've just published a photography coffee table book. Uh, so it's a full color book with 75 pages, um, a double page spread of every country that I went to in Africa. Um, and so it's a mix of landscapes and wildlife and people and places and, and all of the parts of Africa that, that I really fell in love with. And so I hope that people can can get an, an understanding of what it looks like to, to spend so much time in Africa. Uh, and that's called 999 Days Around Africa, and it's on Amazon. You know, I guess that 999 actually sticks out better than 1,000 because everybody, yeah. everybody goes, why isn't it 1,000? I got to get that right. book. And if, <laughs> and if you guys haven't been following Dan, uh, theroadchoseme.com, uh, on Instagram or uh, have seen any of his photos, maybe in uh, the Jeep Freak magazine. You were doing a, a thing for Jeep Freak, weren't you? That's right, yeah, a JP Freak Adventure magazine. JP Freak, yeah. So uh, if you haven't seen any of those pictures, absolutely stunning pictures. Uh, Dan does a really good job taking pictures. Oh, yeah. So you're going to want to see that book. You're going to want to uh, get that coffee table book. Now, don't take it to the bathroom. Only read uh-huh. it at the coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, thank you so much for being with us and, uh, you know, lots of luck. And uh, it sounds like a wonderful deal, uh, uh, you know, going this this whole trip for Africa. I would assume the plan now is to scrape together some more money and then go someplace new. <laughs> That's definitely the plan. Um, and I always say, spoiler alert, I'm probably going to go to the parts of the world map that I've never been before. Sure. That absolutely <laughs> makes sense. It, it probably won't be Australia, though, right? Probably not. I mean, it's, it's an option. I mean, I've only seen less than 10% of Australia. So, I mean, there's a lot of Australia that's unknown to me and, and looks really beautiful. Well, we look forward to uh, hearing your next adventure. And please stay in uh, stay in touch with everything that's going on. Let us know where you're going to be because I'm, I'm sure our listeners would like to, if, if you're going to be close to them, I'm sure they would like to come out, shake your hand, look at the truck, and uh, count all the little uh, dents and scratches you got from the flop. Absolutely. And there is a list on my website as well of um, which shows I'm going to be at this coming summer. So if you, yeah, check it up on uh, theroadchoseme.com. Perfect. Come on, Tammy. I know. I didn't want to be the, say the last thing. <laughs> Tony always gives me grief because I have to have the last word. Yeah, and it bothers her. That's why I keep doing it. And it, it's hard hilarious. for me not to say anything. <laughs> Hey, this is Tony. I'm interrupting the show briefly to let you know that there's some great Dan Grek 
bonus content uh, that's only available on the Jeep Talk Show app. So go over to the Apple Store or the Android Store, download it uh, to your phone or tablet so you can hear it. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, back to the show. Oh, a very special thanks again to Dan Greck for taking the time to come back on the show once again and talk about his amazing trip around Africa in his Jeep. Such an adventure. Well, do you have an idea for a guest? Maybe you want to share your own Jeep story. Hey, maybe you just went wheeling last weekend and there was an interesting recovery or an obstacle and uh, hey, there's a story behind it. We want to hear it. Everybody's got a Jeep story. We want to hear yours. Maybe you know somebody who works in the off-road industry or maybe you yourself works in the off-road industry. We want to talk with you or your friend or hear your story, whatever. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact right now and share your idea for our next great guest. And coming up next week, Jerry from Old Soldier Ironworks. You remember him from a past interview. He's the guy that uh, builds the flag holders for your Jeep. It's a, a very ingenious uh, non-two-inch receiver solution. Uh, so we'll hear more about that next week. Hey, guys. It's Allie from Canada. I just wanted to phone in and tell Tony that it's all his fault. It's all Tony's fault that when one of my taillights and my TJ went out, I immediately thought of, oh, I'll get LED lights. And then it's like a disease. And I want blinker lights and headlights. And all my lights now are LED. So you're welcome, Tony. Thanks for infecting me with the LED light bulb disease. Keep up the great work. You guys do an awesome job. Bye for now. So he's bitching at me on on uh, texting, you know, through uh, uh, the voicemail number. And I'm saying, but dude, the, they're only like $14 a pair, and you get the ones for the front, you only get the ones for the back. And I'm, I'm and $374 no, later. No, it was, it was closer to $200. And uh, Oh, then you got to replace the glove box light, and there's the and, dome and light, that, there's the ones underneath the dash. No, this, so is just got, the, this is just the outside ones. And I said, the headlines are the ones that are most expensive. And then he says... I'm in Canada, eh? It all costs more up here. Yeah, I bet it does. <laughs> and, then he, and then I think the, 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 the conversation went to uh, the free health care. So it all oh. made sense. So, oh, Lord. Well, you have to get oh. the money somehow, so th- their stuff costs more there. That, I think, was what, what was the point he was trying to make. So, yeah, you know, the, so if you're an American and you uh, can get the, the cheap Amazon stuff or your local auto parts place and get the, the cheap LED lights, because they really are cheap now, Thank your lucky stars. Mm-hmm. I, I'm wondering if it was actually the kid's fault. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I was picking yeah. up with a small a small child in the background. Yeah. yeah subliminal messages. L L L E D D D. You know, and it's uh, pretty soon he, he's, he, all he's always hearing is LED, LED, LED. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I kid's love fault. the I love the LEDs though. They're so bright, and you don't have to worry about them burning out. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And uh, clarify a few things that Tammy said last week. Uh, yeah, I'm rocking a bald set of all terrains, but they're 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 not totally bald. They're uh, we're like in the comb over the comb <laughs> over stage of balding. Man, that was a tough one to say, especially when you've been drinking. But anyhow, uh, so I, I, I needed new tires, and you'll be happy to know that this week I bought four new tires. <gasps> Unfortunately, they're on my daughter's Honda. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why I'm calling this week. I've noticed on uh, some of the videos that Tammy took that I, I have put on a few pounds. So uh, I'm going to start this new diet. It's an almond diet. Uh-oh. Yeah, I know. It sounds kind of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys and girls, I'll uh, chat you later. And you have a good one. Bye. Um, not the direction I thought he was going to go with that. <laughs> Man, that was that was work, worse than the construction joke. Yeah. <laughs> All the or signs are better. He, yeah. He's he's reading um, Tony's joke book, <laughs> which you can buy at uh, Amazon.com. Right. You must have needed this every day. Every day. I need it. It's the Jeep Talk Show's must-have stuff pick of the week for your Jeep. And this week, our must-have stuff pick of the week for your Jeep item is Black Magic Fast Wax. Now, Tammy was uh, saying a little something kind of about the same thing that I'm going to be talking mm-hmm. about here 
uh, in, in her segment in Wrangler Talk. Now, now if you were to butter. use it for its <laughs> intended purpose, the label would tell you that this product cleans and waxes at the same time, enhancing the shine of your vehicle's exterior, removes oxidation, restores natural color with an intense shine, even provides a durable water-beating finish that is safe for all vehicles. And all of this is true, but I'm not recommending this to make your Jeep shiny again. Actually, it's for quite the opposite. Spring is here and summer isn't too far behind, but a lot of the trail systems are still pretty soggy. And soggy trails means lots of mud. And mud always means more cleaning. So if you hate trying to get all that dirt and mud out from under your Jeep, well, it's time to break out the black magic. Spraying some of this on your fenders, and especially in the wheel wells, will help keep that dirt and mud from sticking too severely. Yes, even that clay you sometimes find yourself in. In order for this trick to work best, though, the surface needs to be clean and dry. So it's time for a detail. Use this on the hood, the sides, anywhere on your Jeep for a nice, clean, and shiny look, if that's what you're after. And when it's time to hit the trails, use this very liberally in key spots to make cleanup very easy once you're within reach of a hose. I am going to have to try this stuff. Now, you can get this stuff at pretty much any part store uh, for, you know, around six bucks, give or take a couple few dollars. Uh, Amazon, we're going to have a link in the show notes for this episode, where on Amazon, you can get a six pack of this stuff to make sure that you never run out. You could uh, hook up an additional uh, one of those uh, uh, windshield wiper squirters and just stick them over there oh. for your, on your wheel wells. <laughs> <laughs> Be great if somebody came up with some uh, peanut butter scent in those things, too. Oh, geez. Well, now that you must have your own black magic solution, we're going to make it easy for you to get. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com and look for the link in the show notes for episode 386, eh, or you can just go to your parts store. And coming up in a few minutes, we're going to hear a little bit about some events that are happening in your hometown and around the nation in Wheeling Ware. Oh, boy. It's the weekend again. A long weekend. Yeah, that's true. Goodness. Oh, man. Have I needed this weekend? Yes. Why well, do you need this weekend? Just to get well, away because, from work? Well, or do you have lots to do? Pretty much. Pretty much just getting away from work and stuff. I mean, yes, I, I am going to be doing some side work as well. I got another audio system install that I have lined up this weekend. Uh, I'm going to be doing that. Uh, on Saturday, um, I'm going to try and get out up into the hills for maybe a little bit of a day trip, maybe go shooting. I, I'm not quite sure, but I'm definitely going to get out and get up into some nature uh, over the long weekend. So uh, how that happens and where, I am uncertain. It's going to be kind of one of those seat by the seat of, by the seat of your pants type of adventures. Right. So uh, we'll see all, how it all happens. So yeah, busy weekend, got things planned, um, got some work lined up, and uh, we're doing some voiceover work in the studio as well. So uh, yeah, just glad to be not working at work. <laughs> I, I'm sure I've asked you this before, Josh. Have you installed an Android head unit? No, I, I haven't yet. I haven't uh, come across one of those. One of the last ones that I installed that was kind of out of, uh, out of the norm was a, uh, a deck that did not have a CD player. Um, yeah. now I, this is coming, uh, coming from a guy who worked in an era where there were still tape decks oh, yeah. uh, being installed. And, and so I, I've, I've seen pretty much every technology, uh, come and go aside from eight tracks. Uh, I'm not that old. Jeez. Uh, so, but no, I haven't uh, seen the Android decks yet. Now I've installed the ones that have like the Apple CarPlay or the, uh, mirror link and, and stuff like that to where basically you can put your cell phone screen on the screen of the stereo right. And pretty much operate the st uh, your phone through the stereo and stuff like that. Um, but no, not the Android decks. I, I would imagine those are pretty cool, uh, feature packed, and everything else like that. Um, I just haven't ran into one personally yet. I was just curious. I've been looking at them for a number of years now, and uh, I looked at it again today. And now they have a unit that uh, doesn't take up. It's it's still two DIN, but one of the problems about putting a two DIN uh, receiver in a Cherokee is a Cherokee is a DIN, a DIN and a half. Yeah, and you got to cut some stuff. Now this oh, thing, yeah. this thing I was looking at is a two din, but it's really like a uh, a tablet 
with a protrusion in the bottom. And actually, if the protrusion was in the top, I'm sure it would be just fine because the, the problem seems to be the AC. Actually, you know how much the ducting. I'm actually going to have to look at it. I, I'm thinking it's below, but it may be above or, or both. But you actually have to notch the AC uh, ducting in the Cherokee to make it fit. I mean, there is there is enough room there, but they've got some stuff in the way. Um, but uh, this this thing is like literally like as thin as a tablet, 7-inch uh, diagonal screen, uh, touch sensitive. Uh, it's got the USB connection so that you, you know, you really don't need a DVD or CD anymore unless you, no. unless you got a big collection and you just want to fumble with stuff while you're driving down the road. And I mean, it's got GPS, it's got everything. $89. Wow. Or, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I've, I've looked, yeah, I know, but I've looked at the reviews and, uh, on, uh, on, on YouTube and it, it works great. AM and FM, uh, tuners. So, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, that's, that's not very much to, to risk, uh, as far as, uh, you know, the ones no, I've been looking the, at, it's like upwards of $200 for the non name no, brands in most Jeeps that, that are a uh, din and a half and not double din, the amount of modifications that are involved, it's going to be going far beyond just, well, I got to take a file and a little bit of a razor blade to this piece of trim right here. If you look into some of the write-ups to put a double din and a din and a half in a Jeep, it's extensive. Well, that's why uh, I mentioned so, the AC ducting. You actually have to notch the AC ducting and glue it back well, together. Well, I've, I've seen people actually relocate the HVAC controls down below yeah. to where the switch panel is and move the switch panel up. And I mean, we're obviously, that's not something that somebody's going to do in an afternoon in their driveway and no. certainly not without specialty tools and a lot of experience. So, yeah, what you're talking about is is definitely upper level installation type of work, not for your average everyday you know, shade tree mechanic or somebody who knows how to put a stereo in. Uh, you're going to need to know, you know, how to modify an interior of a vehicle properly in order to do it in, in that kind of an install. Well, it's real easy to, to have a look, though. You can pop that. To Absolutely. On the Cherokee, you can pop that cover off. It doesn't even bolt, uh, isn't even screwed in. And then uh, the radio, uh, radio comes out really, really easy. A couple, mm -hmm. of, couple of screws. Bolts. And then yeah. you can look at all the space that you have in there. So. Uh, but don't, don't limit yourself. I have a look at it and make a plan. And uh, I, I've seen it where you don't have to relocate the controls. So uh, that's the way I was looking at it. So we'll, we'll see. But anyway, I was just curious if you had run across uh, any uh, Android head units. Uh, I think Cody talked about it in the last tra Trail Chasers episode and uh, uh, listening to podcasts and uh, using GPS for off-road. And it just, you know, it just, it just sounds like it'd be a lot of... A lot of fun. I mean, I like having the radio on there, but I listen to podcasts mainly, and it would be nice just to either stream it from the phone or uh, use the Wi-Fi connection when I'm in the garage and let it up update the uh, the podcast to the Android head unit where I just press play and listen to the shows. There you go. Well, Tammy, do you have anything going on <laughs> for the long weekend? Um, just that's nice. Moving along, yes, we've I got know. some. No, Moving right kidding. along. <laughs> Actually, she's going to be uh, sitting, uh, putting a sprinkler underneath her chair and uh, enjoying the whole weekend. Oh, geez. Um, uh, no, not really. My son comes home. He's actually in your neck of the woods, Tony. Um, he's down in McAllen, Texas, was down there for two weeks. So he comes home. So I'll be excited to see him. And we are just rearranging some rooms in our house. So, and then that's it. But I really need to get working on my Lux rock lights. Was he uh, uh, was he driving down here in uh, in Texas? No, he, no, he flew down. He's um, he works for Carmax, and they're opening up a new store down in McAllen, Texas. So he um, they picked him to come help op open up the, wow. the store. Wow, that's yeah. really cool. So he's re 19. reloading the vending machine with the cars. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. He goes, I'm really surprised at all the border police that are down there. Oh, There's like, I, yeah, no, yeah. I, don't, I don't doubt it with the border crisis. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, the reason why I asked if he was driving down here, because I, I don't know if you guys are aware of it or not, but uh, to drive in Texas legally, and it, you don't want to get caught, uh, not having a firearm, because we use them to <laughs> indicate uh, left hand and right hand turns, you know, where normally <laughs> you would just stick your hand out. It's uh, it's one shot for right, two shots for left. You know, because I if did you're gonna, not know that if you're going to be shooting the left, you want to make sure they're uh, they're dead. <laughs> but I'm bum. <laughs> uh, and you know, today I um, this black jeep passed me, and it was you know that loud um, muffler sound. Yeah. Exhaust, yes. Um, yeah, or exhaust. So I'm like looking underneath his jeep. 
and like the stock <laughs> man my eyes are up here <laughs> i know the the stock um muffler? exhaust yeah. muffler you know that it goes the full almost the full length underneath the, the wranglers yeah and when i was at uari someone was showing me that you can just totally take that off and you know because it will help when you're rock crawling you're not gonna you know oh yeah to <laughs> scrape it and there's and I I don't know it, there's some other thing that you can do glass back to, is that what it is well glass backs well, are generally I mean, really really small so yeah, you're talking about the one where the like, where the uh, the exhaust uh, the muffler is is right back there in the back like where uh, where the uh, is it is is that where the fuel tank is, Josh? Is that where the the fuel tank is? It's 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 uh, in front. Well, it's behind the fuel tank. So if you're looking at the back of the vehicle, you have the muff. You see the muffler before yeah. you see the gas tank. It looks right, kind of right. hang, hangs down kind of low. I mean, I can yeah. see what she's talking about. I mean, but that, they th- apparently there's something. I'm sure someone out there knows, but there's something you can do to take that off and then like rework your exhaust system to help you for when you're off roading. Oh, I so don't doubt not, it. So um, anyway, I thought maybe maybe someone can call in and let me know what it is so I could start researching. I was great. Um, I, I yeah, I was just gonna say we get somebody on here that uh, knows the, the Wranglers uh, to talk about some stuff. It'd be really really good. Maybe they would know. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there there are tons of, of really aftermarket. Cool. There are tons of aftermarket cat back exhausts, which basically you remove everything from the catalytic converter back from the Jeep and you install a new system, and that's new pipes new crossover, new mufflers, you know, the whole kit and caboodle, all brand new, uh, depending on whether or not you have a four-cylinder, right. a six, or a V8, you know, yada, yada, yada. So, uh, and they all sound completely different because they're yeah. all from a different manufacturer. They all have their own proprietary technology that's incorporated in the design. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, and then there's just the full-on custom where, yeah, the guy goes down and grabs a, you know, a, a thrush glass pack or something, like, you know, cherry bomb, you know, one of those <laughs> oh, things, and, no. you know, welds that in or maybe doesn't even go far that far, just yanks everything out and straight pipes it all the way back and, you know, no muffler, nothing, and just there you go. So, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do back there. I, I will warn you, though, uh, if you're thinking about getting a muffler that has that better throaty sound to it, it's oh, all it's all so fun and cool. games until you've been driving it for four hours and you yeah. get out and, you, <laughs> and you're you going like, oh my God. and your head is going. Uh, <laughs> I just it just sounds so badass. Too. It does. It does. And for short trips, it's not a problem. But uh, two, three hours. Yeah. All oh the way to Roush God, Creek. Yes. Or listening to that on the trail. Sometimes you can hear them in my videos. People who have those. Yeah, glass pack, especially those cherry bombs. I remember the cherry bombs back in the uh, the the late seventies, early eighties. Boy, the cherry bombs were just horrible. They were loud, but God, they were just horrible. And you'd hear the backfire too because of the uh, that's, no back that's, pressure. <laughs> that's my muffler. I'm I'm running a glass pack muffler right now. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I had uh, on my three twenty seven when I had my Nova. I had uh, uh, two headers, uh, and in the collectors. I just jammed a couple of uh, uh, glass packs in there, so Jeez. so they didn't run out to the side of the vehicle or all the way to the back. It was just, just straight header down. Yeah, header oh to glass God. packs, and I didn't put a U bolt or anything <laughs> to hold them in. And every so often, one would fall off uh, if I went over a, off. went over railroad track. So I'd have to circle back around, <laughs> pick it up, you know, handle it like it's a hot potato, and stick it oh, back yeah. in. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, good man. times, good times. Yeah, I'd say <laughs> it was actually the uh, the emergency brake cable uh, on the on the the Nova. It actually crossed over so that they would just sit up right on top of the emergency brake cable, which is another good oh. safety thing. <laughs> 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 oh, to be sixteen oh, again. <laughs> they don't build them like that anymore. <laughs> Probably for good reason. <laughs> Well, if you want to join in on the campfire side chat, we'd love to have you. Go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and find out all the ways you can reach out to us and join in on the fun. Now let's get to some events from around the world and maybe in your neck of the woods. And don't forget to let us know about an event that you are planning or are involved in or uh, volunteering with, whatever. Uh, Get the information to us. We'll get it out to the masses. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. Click and fill out our wheeling wear form 
and we'll make sure to get that information out there. Now, we had a listener of the show, Travis Estes, call or uh, email the show rather, tell us that he's going to try and get a club that he knows about involved and get them uh, to call the show or to write us or whatever to tell us about a charitable event. They didn't do it until the very last minute. So, Travis, thank you for trying. Chris Moore, you need to try better next time. <laughs> they got this one in just in the nick of time. It's happening this weekend, so uh, chances are a lot of people are going to miss out on this one. Uh, the Wicked Jeeps Memorial Benefit for Officer Sheldon's Family. Uh, this is happening May 25th, it's, like I said, this weekend at the River Wild Restaurant in Mount Gilead, North Carolina. Uh, this is a benefit for a fallen officer. Good cause. Uh, for more information on this, please check out the uh, Wicked Jeeps Facebook page, Wicked Jeeps North Carolina. Uh, we also have the uh, Jeep Jamboree USA presenting the 27th annual Drummond Island Jeep Jamboree happening June 6th through the 8th on Drummond Island in Michigan. We also have the Bantam Jeep Heritage Festival. Heard about that a little while ago. Uh, happening June 7th through the 9th and in Butler, Pennsylvania. For more information on these events or others and links to all the good information and all the good stuff, visit jeeptalkshow.com website and click the, uh, the show notes for this episode. That's it for this show for this week, my fellow Jeeper. Until next week, be sure to download and use the free Jeep Talk Show app. As always, thank you for listening to the world's most downloaded Jeep podcast. And be good. If you can't be good, at least be good at what you're doing. Podcasting since 2010. You know, there's a, <clears throat> a downside to having um, security cameras around your house. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention this because everybody goes security cameras, man, or you got a bad neighborhood. No, I just like being able to see outside. I've, I've always thought yeah. it'd be really cool to uh, have a monitor where you're, you know, you can see what's going on outside, especially when there's noises. Uh, maybe you're hearing a rumbling noise and you're wondering what that, uh, what's driving by or, or whatever. You can just glance up and, and look and see. So we're doing the show and some huge white thing passes in front of one of the cameras very quickly. Uh oh! And I'm like, the camera, the the camera is up high, so you know it's well above six feet. So you know, for a moment, and and it's it's dark out, so the infrared light reflects off of something. Yeah. Oh God, you scared the (laughs) shit out of me, Josh. Jeez. Oh, you were right in my head too. (laughs) Oh my God.